Thank you all for coming. This is uh, the third in a set of five lectures about the achievements of the Civil Rights Revolution. Um, in uh, lecture number one, I spoke about uh, a case, a case involving Mary Hamilton. It was a, just a straight out case of just naked racist mistreatment. You'll recall that's the case in which a civil rights protester refused to answer any questions unless she was addressed by her proper full name. She was sentenced to, um, she was convicted of uh, criminal contempt of court sentence, the Supreme Court of the United States reversed her conviction. Um, lecture number two was about the uh, beguiling myth of separate but equal. So in, you know, in, in the Mary Hamilton case, there was no separate but equal. She was just clearly mistreated. And the question was, what was the legal system going to do about that? Separate but equal, it gets a little bit more complicated because, of course, the theory of separate but equal was that everybody was being treated equally. Um, and I used as the case for focusing on that problem, Browder versus Gale, which is the case that arose from the, uh, well, it was one of the cases that arose from the Montgomery bus boycott. But it was in that case that the Supreme Court of the United States affirmed a lower court decision which essentially reversed Plessy versus Ferguson. Today's uh, talk is about the legal status of invidious racial exclusions uh, uh, by private parties. And this is a subject that prompts us to confront the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, a key legislative accomplishment of the Second Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 covered a wide range of subjects, three of which are particularly noteworthy, three of which we use day to day, whether we know it or not. Uh, one provision of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits invidious racial discrimination in places of public accommodations. Um, that's Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. There's another provision that prohibits invidious racial discrimination across broad areas of the employment market. That's Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And then there's another provision of the Civil Rights Act that enjoins the federal government to withhold federal funding from entities that engage in unlawful racial discrimination. That's Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, now, the regulation of employment is the activity which currently gives rise to the most litigation and political controversy. But in the early 1960s, the prospect of regulating racial discrimination in places of public accommodations hotels, restaurants, filling stations, and the like. It was that that gave rise to the most vociferous disputation. And it's that subject that I'm mainly going to be uh, focusing on uh, this afternoon. Now, um, the Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, represents one of the movements, the civil rights movements, great triumphs insofar as that Act subjects large areas of social activity um, to anti-discrimination law. Uh, large swaths of social activity that were previously unregulated by federal law. And that was a tremendous achievement. The reason why the act raises the specter of defeat, however, is that the civil rights activists were unable to convince the Supreme Court that individuals have a constitutional right, not simply a statutory right, but a constitutional right to be free of invidious racial discrimination in places of public accommodation. Or, putting it somewhat differently, or that those engaging in discrimination have no rightful claim to governmental assistance in effectuating their racial prejudices. 
the civil rights activists, the civil rights dissidents, Martin Luther King and company, were unable to convince the Supreme Court that individuals have a constitutional right to be free of racial discrimination in the use of places of public accommodation. And it was that failure, it was that failure on the part of the civil rights movement that gave rise to demands for legislative relief. Now behind Title II, the public accommodation section of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, were numerous protests in which activists occupied privately owned commercial facilities that had customarily been reserved for whites only. One justly celebrated protest occurred in Greensboro, North Carolina on February 1, 1960, when Easel Blair Jr., now Jabril Kazan, Joseph McNeil, David Richman, and Franklin McCain, four freshmen at North Carolina A&T College, sat in at a Woolworths lunch counter at which they were refused service on account of their race. The next day they returned, reinforced by classmates. They returned the next day and the next and the next, each time in greater numbers. On the sixth day of the sit-ins, the store received a bomb threat and was emptied by the police. When it opened the next Monday, the lunch counter was closed. Soon afterwards, the dissidents accepted a proposed truce period for negotiation. But by then, they had already lit a fire that flared brilliantly across the South. Within 60 days, the sit-in movement had spread to at least 54 cities and nine states. Historian William H. Chafee did not exaggerate when he maintained that the Greensboro sit-ins constituted a watershed in the history of America. Although similar demonstrations had occurred before, never had they prompted such a volcanic response. At lunch counters, restaurants, and department stores. Now again, it's really important. All these places are places that are owned by private parties. So at privately owned lunch counters, at privately owned restaurants, at privately owned department stores all across the South, Students, mainly blacks, but some whites as well, challenge uh, traditional color bars. On March 14, 1960, Simon Bowie and a friend were arrested when they refused to heed a police officer's demand that they leave the luncheonette department at Eckerd's Drugstore in Columbia, South Carolina, after being told that pursuant to store policy, Negroes were not eligible for service there. On March 31st, 1960, police arrested Simon, <coughs> uh, arrested James Gober and nine other black students in Birmingham, Alabama. On April 13th, James, Frank James Looper and a friend were arrested for trespass in Little Rock, Arkansas, after they refused to leave an eating area at the Blast department store. On May 6th, John, John Thomas Avent and seven colleagues, five blacks and two whites, were arrested after declining to leave a whites-only luncheonette at a Crest store in Durham, North Carolina. On June 7th, Arthur Ham, a student, pushed a pastor, Reverend C.A. Ivory, who was bound to a wheelchair, into a McGrory's dime store in Rock Hill, South Carolina. They proceeded to the lunch counter where their food order was refused. When they, when they declined to leave, they were arrested for trespass. On June 17th, Robert Mack Bell, a future Chief Justice of the Maryland Supreme Court, and 11 other black students were arrested for sitting in at Hooper's Restaurant in Baltimore, Maryland. On June 30th, William L. Griffin and four colleagues were arrested when they refused to leave the Glen Echo Amusement Park in Montgomery County, Maryland. On September 17th, in New Orleans, Sidney Langston Goldfish and three friends, a white and three blacks, were arrested after they staged a sit-in. These individuals were among thousands prosecuted for crossing color lines in privately owned places of public accommodation in the months following February 1, 1960. 
The people I just mentioned, however, are distinctive in that their cases were adjudicated by the Supreme Court of the United States. Actually, there's another reason why I wanted to mention their names, and it's purely sentimental. It's just that often these folks don't have their names mentioned. And it seems to me that they should have their names mentioned. We can't nail the names of the thousands and thousands. Jack Greenberg estimated that the Legal Defense Fund in the first three years of the 1960s represented some 13,000 people who were arrested in actions like this. We can't remember all their names, but some of them, it seems to me, we should memorialize. One of the reasons why I so like um, Richard Kluger's book, Simple Justice, it's a great book on Brown versus Board of Education, is that he begins the book by talking about the people who brought the cases and brings them alive and makes their names known to us. By 1960, it had been it had long been established by the Supreme Court the, that the 14th Amendment prohibited public agencies or officials from discriminating against people on a racial basis. But what about discrimination by private parties? That was the central question posed by the sit-ins. The 14th Amendment declares that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. In 1883, in the civil rights cases, the Supreme Court elucidated what it took to be the meaning of that provision. Congress had enacted in 1875 a statute that, among other things, barred racial discrimination in privately owned places of public accommodation. Congress acted pursuant to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which gives Congress authority to pass appropriate legislation to enforce that amendment. The Supreme Court invalidated the Civil Rights Act of 1875, or at least invalidated that portion involving uh, public accommodations, on the grounds that that, stat that that portion of the statute reached beyond the scope of the 14th Amendment and thus beyond the reach of legislation that could rightly be authorized by Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, the court concluded, protects individuals only against state action, not the action of private parties. According to the court, civil rights, such as are guaranteed by the Constitution against state aggression, cannot be impaired by the wrongful acts of individuals, unsupported by state authority in the shape of laws, customs, or judicial or executive proceedings. In the court's view, misconduct by a private party was a wrong, but not a constitutional wrong. The wrongful act of an individual is simply a private wrong, said the court. That understanding, that sharp distinction between private conduct that does not trigger the 14th Amendment's protection and public conduct that does trigger the 14th Amendment's protection, that became known as the state action doctrine. One of the key legal developments of the 20th century in terms of American constitutional law involved the enlargement by the courts of the category of circumstances deemed to be state action. Some important state action cases arose from controversies having nothing to do with race relations. In Marsh versus Alabama, for instance, a Jehovah's Witness was convicted of violating an Alabama statute that made it a crime to remain on the premises of another after having been asked to leave. The defendant insisted upon distributing her religious literature on a sidewalk in a town owned by a private corporation. She maintained that barring her uh, from the sidewalks of this town would abridge her federal constitutional right to freedom of religion in the press. The state maintained that the federal constitution was inapplicable because the party doing the excluding was private, the company that owned the town, and that hence there existed an absence of state action. The Supreme Court, in an opinion written by Justice Hugo Black, disagreed, discerning circumstances that should trigger the application of federal constitutional limitations, notwithstanding the private status of the company town. 
The more an owner for his own advantage opens up his property for use by the public in general, the more do his rights become circumscribed by the statutory and constitutional rights of those who use it. Although Marsh had nothing to do with race, other key state action cases did. In Shelley versus Kramer, a black family bought and moved into a house encumbered by a contractual term which stipulated that for a period of 50 years, only persons of the Caucasian race could occupy the property. White neighbors of the black family went to court to seek enforcement of the racially restrictive covenant. They obtained a state order a state court order that evicted the black family from the house they had purchased. The family asserted that that order violated their rights under the federal constitution because it had listed the state in carrying out an act of invidious racial discrimination. Reversing a long, well-established line of precedent, the Supreme Court of the United States sided with the black family. Restrictive covenant standing alone cannot be regarded as violative of any rights guaranteed by the 14th Amendment, Chief Justice Fred Vinson declared. So long as the purpose of those agreements are effectuated by voluntary adherence to their terms, it would appear clear that there's been no action by the state. But here in this case, there was more, said the court. That more was the state court's order enforcing the private um, racially discriminatory agreement. According to the court, that judicial enforcement represented a species of state action which triggered the 14th Amendment's protection. Now, when the students engaged in sit-ins to protect racial discrimination at privately owned commercial establishments in the early 1960s, judges responded in four different ways. One way was followed uniformly by local judges in the South. Local judges in the South, when they, uh, when they received these sit-in cases, they basically took the position that the conduct of the students was simple trespass, breach of the peace, similar crimes. And their basic position was these are simple crimes um, these, are, these are simply cases in which students have encroached on the private rights of private parties that have the right to serve who they want. And that's the way in which the um, uh, local uh, 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 state court judges in the South uh, handled uh, the matter. The southern state court judges were clearly on the side of segregationists or those who wanted to engage in racial discrimination, though they generally avoided editorializing. I mean, if you read the state court opinions of the Southern judges, they don't, they don't you know, deliver segregationist tracts. They're very spare opinions um, that avoid editorializing. Armed with precedent favorable to private practitioners of invidious racial discrimination, the Southern judges wrote careful, bland opinions that supported the convictions of the protesters without doctrinal strain. And that was one way of handling, the, the judges handled the cases. The majority of the justices of the Supreme Court responded in a second way. They creatively manipulated existing doctrines to grant relief to the protesters all the while pretending that they were neutrally applying precedent. So, for instance, one of the key sit-in cases was a case from uh, South Carolina, uh, Peterson, Peterson versus uh, the city of, of, of Greenville. And this was a case in which the South Carolina Supreme Court said this is an easy case. These people uh, sat in, they were asked to leave, they didn't leave. They were trespassing. The Supreme Court, however, viewed the case uh, a little bit uh, uh, differently. Um, the South Carolina Supreme Court noted that there was a city ordinance uh, um, uh, demanding 
that uh, restaurants be segregated. Uh, but the Supreme Court of South Carolina said, you know, uh, that's not why these people were arrested. They weren't arrested for violating that ordinance. They were arrested for a um, uh, for violating the law of trespass, which has nothing to do with race. The Supreme Court, however, saw that city ordinance as being absolutely central to the case. Um, Chief Justice Warren, when he wrote uh, uh, Pedersen, he did not merely characterize the city ordinance. He did not merely uh, summarize the city ordinance. He did not merely consign it to a footnote. He quoted the city ordinance in whole, totally, on the pages of the United States um, uh, reports. He quoted it in full um, in all of its grotesque segregationist glory. And in fact, in my, in my very first lecture, I read from this particular uh, ordinance. This was the ordinance that said that uh, blacks and whites could not be uh, served uh, in the same place, except under certain circumstances. They could be served if they were served using different utensils, if they were served using different plates that had a different color scheme, if they were served and they were you know, in different parts of the building, at least uh, 35 feet separate. Under those circumstances, they could be served. Um, the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Warren, cites all of that. And the Supreme Court said, listen, we can't, you know, we can't close our eyes to uh, this ordinance. We are going to, we are, we're reaching the conclusion that um, the, the, the very presence of this ordinance removed the ability of the manager of the, you know, of the, of the establishment, removed free choice from that uh, proprietor. The Supreme Court took the position that when a state, uh, when a state agency or when a city passes a law compelling persons to, persons to discriminate against other persons because of race uh, and the state's criminal processes are employed in a way which enforces the discrimination mandated by law, the Supreme, uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren said, we're gonna assume that that is state action. We're going to assume that the very presence of that ordinance wipes out the ability of the private party to reach any other conclusion than it's going to you know, follow this, the state's mandate. Now, in Peterson, the Supreme Court was determined to find state action. That's the words we use. I mean, we say, you know, the court tried to find state action. Well, state action isn't a rock. It's not a, it's not, you know, it's not a book. It's not, you know, it's not that bottle of water right there. It's not something that one finds. It's a concept. And different courts can do different things with this concept. The Supreme Court of the United States was determined in Peterson to find state action in order to trigger the 14th Amendment. Justice Harlan wanted to, um, uh, the court to remand the case back to the S S South Carolina S uh, S courts to determine whether, in fact, the Crest management s wanted on their own to engage in racial uh, discrimination. If so, I mean, if Justice Harlan's position was, we, sh we shouldn't just say, we shouldn't just uh, conclusively say that the presence of this uh, provision wiped out the ability of the private owners of Cress to engage in discrimination if they wanted. We, that's a factual question, which we should, you know, let's, let's do some uh, fact finding here. If they truly wanted to discriminate against blacks, then fine. They have the right to. That was uh, Harlan's uh, position. But the court did not want to give uh, private racial discrimination that much breathing room. 
So it made the presence of a segregation ordinance conclusive proof of state compulsion, even if that ordinance was not being enforced, even if, in fact, a court had said that that uh, ordinance could not be enforced. A similar determination to find objectionable state action is evident in other sit-in cases. In Lombard versus Louisiana, for instance, no, state or, no city or state law required segregation in restaurants, but the Supreme Court of the United States discerned this mandate in the public statements of New Orleans mayor and superintendent of police, both of whom condemned sit-ins and warned that officials would enforce city and state laws. They just said this. I mean, they made the statement that, you know, our state laws would be enforced. The Supreme Court treated their remarks as tantamount to an ordinance requiring segregation. Again, Justice Harlan viewed the matter differently. Justice Harlan read their statements more generously. In his view, they did not press private uh, proprietors to segregate e eating facilities, but simply urge Negroes and whites not to insist on non-segregated services in places where segregated uh, service obtained. And as for the warnings of the, of the police commissioner and the mayor, Harlan saw the official statements as quite possibly an effort merely to preserve the peace in what they might reasonably have regarded as, highly, as a highly charged atmosphere. You know, often judges give um, uh, officials the benefit of the doubt. But in these cases, the Supreme Court of the United States, or at least the majority, were unwilling to do that. Their sentiments obviously favored the protesters in an orientation that expressed itself doctrinally in the creative construction of state action in circumstances that could easily, easily have produced different conclusions. There was a third way of handling the uh, sit-in cases, and this third response was best displayed in the jurisprudence of Justice Harlan, to whom I just referred. Justice Harlan disagreed with the Supreme Court's majority's expansion of the state action uh, concept on behalf of the protesters. Harlan was not hostile to the protesters, and indeed in his opinions, and his various opinions, there are hints that he sympathized with them. But he was unwilling to reformulate state action doctrine on their behalf. He took the doctrine as he found it and applied it with exactitude. Um, seemingly regardless of the outcome. If protesters prevailed, fine, but if protesters lost, that was also acceptable to him. Animating Harlan were two commitments. The broader one was fidelity to the even-handed application of constitutional doctrine. More than any other justice of the period, Harlan exemplified a rigorously analytical attentiveness to neutral principles of adjudication. The narrower commitment that Harlan had was a belief in the wisdom of the state action requirement. Not only did Harlan conclude that an individual's right to restrict the use of his property lies beyond the reach of the 14th Amendment, he also believed that li this limitation on, federal constitutional, on the federal constitution was good Quote, freedom of the individual to choose his associates or his neighbors, to use and dispose of his property as he sees fit, to be irrational, arbitrary, capricious, even unjust in his personal relations, are things all entitled to a large measure of protection from governmental interference. Also inherent in the concept of state action, said Harlan, are values of federalism, a recognition that there are areas of private rights upon which federal power should not lay a heavy hand and which should properly be left to the more precise instruments of local authority. So that was a third camp of judicial response to the crisis brought on by the sit-in movement. But then there was a fourth camp. The fourth camp was so hostile to the segregationist position, at least with respect to places of public accommodation, that it was willing to make an in run around the state action issue or to dramatically recast, some would say eviscerate the state action 
requirement altogether. There were three on the Supreme Court who were in this fourth camp. One person who was in it, though sort of grudgingly, was the Chief Justice Earl Warren. Uh, another person who was in it was uh, Justice Arthur Goldberg. The person who was in the fourth camp who was sort of the, 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 the most militant about it was William O. Uh, Douglas. Douglas argued in the various sit-in cases, he, he always joined the opinions uh, getting the, uh, the um, uh, protesters off the, the hook, but he always wanted to push further. He argued that, the federal, that for the federal government to allow proprietors, um, for the federal courts to allow proprietors of public accommodations to treat colored citizens worse than their peers on racial grounds, is at war with the one class of citizenship created by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. In making this argument, Douglas revived a line of argument posited by the first Justice Harlan in his dissent back in 1883 in the civil rights cases. According to the first Justice Harlan, Harlan freedom from racial discrimination at places of public accommodation is a civil right incident to federal citizenship. It is fundamental in American citizenship, he declared, and, just, and Douglas echoed, that in respect of civil rights, there shall not be discrimination by the state or its officers or by individuals or corporations exercising public functions or authority against any citizen because of his race. That was an argument that Justice Harlan made back in, uh, the first Justice Harlan made back in 1883. It's an argument that William O. Douglas uh, embraced in the early 1960s and tried to revive. There's another argument that William O. Douglas made that, again, uh, echoed the first uh, Justice Harlan. Douglas asserted that segregation of Negroes in restaurants and lunch counters is a relic of slavery. Douglas did not actually refer specifically to the 13th Amendment. The first Justice Harlan did, by the way, in the civil rights cases. But Douglas seems to have been alluding to the 13th Amendment implicitly by condemning Jim Crow in places of public accommodation as a relic of slavery and hence unconstitutional. Third, Douglas sought to enlarge dramatically the concept of state action by construing it as present whenever managers of private property uh, serving the public call upon the state to assist in effectuating their racially discriminatory exclusions. We should put these restaurant cases in line with Shelley versus Kramer, Douglas remarked, holding that what the 14th Amendment requires in restrictive covenant cases is also required from restaurants. Why, he asked, should we refuse to let state, why, he asked, should we refuse to let state courts enforce apartheid in residential areas, but let state courts enforce apartheid in restaurants? For Douglas, state action was glaringly present in prosecutions of people whose only crime was a demand for service free of racial bigotry. So that was the fourth camp. The fourth camp was never able to prevail in the Supreme Court of the United States. An impasse essentially was reached. By and large, in all these sit-in cases, if a case got to the Supreme Court of the United States in the sit-in uh, area, if a case got that far, for the reasons that I've just pointed out, uh, the protester was going to get let off the hook. The Supreme Court was going to find some way to vacate the conviction. On the other hand, on the other hand, the forces of um, the civil rights movement were never able to convince 
the Supreme Court as a matter of constitutional law uh, to um, uh, uh, make racial discrimination in places of public accommodation as a matter of constitutional law uh, illicit. So, what happened? What happened in the light, and since the Supreme Court was never willing to come forward and as a matter of constitutional law uh, make racial discrimination in places of public accommodation illicit, there arose a demand for legislative action. Now, sometimes the legislative action took, uh, uh, took root at the state level. So in the late 1950s, early 1960s, there were a number of states that passed laws prohibiting racial discrimination in public accommodation. But of course, that was not going to happen in the Deep South states. In the Deep South states, uh, there was not going to be state anti-discrimination legislation. If there was going to be relief, that relief was going to have to come from uh, the federal government, and hence there arose a demand for legislative relief by the um, federal uh, government. Now, um, the administration of John F. Kennedy, after a considerable period where the Kennedy administration simply did not want to heed the voices of civil rights activists. I'm gonna drop a footnote here and go autobiographical. When I was growing up, let's see, I was eight years old when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. But I have clear memories of my parents talking about John F. Kennedy. My mother was a big fan of John F. Kennedy's, which always caused a commotion because my father came to loathe John F. Kennedy. He really did. And the reason why he came to loathe John F. Kennedy was because he thought that John F. Kennedy had broken a promise to African Americans. When John F. Kennedy was running for the White House in 1960 against Richard Nixon. Nowadays, people you know, really look down on Richard Nixon. The fact of the matter is, in 1960, Richard Nixon had a better civil rights record than John F. Kennedy. When, when John F. Kennedy ran against Richard Nixon, John, uh, John, uh, it was a tough, close election. Kennedy talked over and over and over again about what he would do if he became president of the United States. He had criticized President Eisenhower for failing to um, prohibit racial discrimination in federally owned housing. Candidate Kennedy said, oh, this could be handled very quickly. Stroke of the pen. It took John F. Kennedy two years to have that stroke of the pen. And for the first two years of his administration, he really gave the cold shoulder to civil rights demonstrators. And I'm just saying, for my dad, I can, I can, I can hear it. He viewed that as just a terrible, terrible betrayer. He really, he really did loathe them. Um, it was only in 1963 that Kennedy started paying heed to the forces of the Civil Rights Revolution, largely because of the uh, crisis in Birmingham, Alabama, the, the Children's Crusade, Bull Connor, the dogs, the people getting knocked over by fire hoses. In June of 1963, John F. Kennedy went on nationwide TV and said that he was proposing civil rights legislation. From June 1963 until July 1964, there was a tremendous fight over that civil rights legislation. We do not have time to get into it now. It was an extraordinary uh, legislative effort. I'll just mention a couple of things about it. 
uh, that legislation gave rise to the longest Senate filibuster in the history of the United States. Um, Sam Irvin and Strom Thurmond and Richard Russell and uh, other segregationist senators did all that they could to um, stop this legislation. They ultimately failed. One of the things that's extraordinary about going back and reading about the legislation, the legislative history of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, one of the extraordinary things is how difficult it was to pass that legislation, even given all that had happened. I mean, remember what happened in 1963-64. John F. Kennedy is assassinated in November of 1963. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, goes to the nation and says there would be no more fitting tribute to our slain president, John F. Kennedy, than to pass this piece of legislation. Even after that, After the assassination of John F. Kennedy, after the assassination of Medgar Evers, after the horror seen night after night after night on the news, the dogs, the bombings, the four little girls killed in Birmingham, after Martin Luther King Jr.'s great I Have a Dream speech and the great March on Washington, after all of that, oh, remember, this, this is all happening in a you know, pretty telescoped short period of time. After all of that, it is still a tremendous effort to get this legislation passed. All sorts of things had to be done to get this legislation passed. In fact, the passage of it, looking back, is still something of a miracle given all of the ways in which bills can be killed. But again, we can't get into that so much. I'm just going to mention one thing, one thing. One of the things that was quite striking in the struggle over the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the question of how it would be justified. And there were two sources of constitutional authority that were looked to as justification for Congress prohibiting racial discrimination in places of public accommodation. One source of authority was Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. And that seems, you know, in many ways, that makes the most sense. I mean, after all, what's the purpose of this legislation? The purpose of the legislation was uh, to carry out a notion of equality in you know, the public life of the country. That seems to sound in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. But remember what I said earlier. In 1883, the Supreme Court of the United States had, struck, had invalidated a public accommodations a provision of the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And so there was a question, well, if this, you know, will the Supreme Court do the same thing if Section 5 is set forth as the justification for the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Now, there were some people who said, well, we got a different Supreme Court, a lot's been learned, you know, let's, let's, let's go with it. The Kennedy administration said, no, no, let's not do that. Rather, let's turn to another source of possible constitutional authority, the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution, especially in the aftermath of the New Deal. The Commerce Clause is a much safer way to go. Uh, the Supreme Court can look to the Commerce Clause, uphold this uh, legislation without having to face its prior, its, its prior cases, the civil rights cases. 
what did the Congress do? The Congress basically went along with the Kennedy administration. It said our primary reason for passing this legislation, or our primary authority, comes from the Commerce Clause. Because after all, you know, when, when black people are denied, uh, uh, you know, are denied uh, bathrooms, are told to go around back to the bathroom, when black people are told that uh, they're not going to be served hamburgers, when black people are told that they can't stay at this, you know, this hotel, it causes black people to travel less. And that's, you know, that's a, that, that's a, that's a burden on commerce. You know, it's bad for the economy. Well, that's what the Congress said, and they, were, you know, they, they, was, they, was, they brought forth evidence to that effect. The, um, so the, the, the primary constitutional authority for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was under the Commerce Clause. And as it turned out, when the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title II, was put to the test through constitutional litigation, the Supreme Court of the United States upheld Title II. Heart of Atlanta, Motel versus the United States, Katzenbach versus McClung, Title II upheld, pretty easily actually, Commerce Clause. Now I'm just going to say one thing about this. In thinking about this, it seems to me that this should resonate with debates that we're having today over another aspect of race relations law. And one thing about it is as follows. Right now, at this law school, at my law school, at law schools all across the United States, and in fact, in lots of places across the United States, people are talking about affirmative action. The Supreme Court has an affirmative action case pending right now with respect to affirmative action in places of higher education. The principal justification for affirmative action in higher education is diversity, the diversity rationale not the rectification of past injustice, not integration, rather a pedagogical theory that there will be you know, better learning if there is diversity. Now, I don't have any. I think that there's something to the diversity theory. I think there's something to it. You know, you know, sort of, that's, that's, what, that's sort of my, my hunch. But is it really the case? I mean, let's suppose for the sake of argument, let's just stipulate that some social scientist was able to convince all of us that actually there was no pedagogical payoff with diversity. Would people who are in favor of affirmative action say, oh, well, in that case, I'm, I, don't, I don't care about affirmative action. And really, would, would, would people react that way? In other words, is it really the case that this pedagogical theory is animating diversity? Or is it the case that people talk about diversity because the Supreme Court, in its doctrine, makes people talk diversity talk? They have something else in mind, for me, you know, rectification of past injustice, but you can't say that because the you know, Supreme Court won't allow you to say that. So you talk diversity talk. Well, it seems to me that that's what's going on with us right now. And it seems to me that that's exactly what was going on in the mid-1960s with the Commerce Clause as the principal justification for Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I'm going to read you a statement made by a senator during debate about this issue. I do not suppose that anyone would seriously contend that the administration is proposing legislation 
or the Congress is considering legislation because it has been suddenly determined after all these years that segregation is a burden on interstate commerce. We are considering legislation because we believe, as the great majority of the people in our country believe, that all citizens have an equal right to have access to goods, services, and facilities which are held out to be available for public use and patronage. In other words, one of the stories of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, particularly Title II, one of the stories has to do with the question of candor, the question of honesty, the question of people just talking straightforwardly about race in America. And back in 1964, people were unable to talk straightforwardly about the issue, and my claim would be the same obtains today, unfortunately. Now, one last matter to deal with, with respect to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I asked, you saw, you saw the, you know, the, the title of the lecture, why did there have to be a 1964 Civil Rights Act? I hope that I've made it clear why there had to be a 1964 Civil Rights Act. The Supreme Court of the United States was unwilling to get rid of private racial discrimination as a constitutional matter. And so if, there, if private racial discrimination was to be gotten rid of, it had to be through congressional legislation. That's the why. What does it all mean? What does it all mean? I want to go back here to pick up a, a thread that I, I, you know, a thread of, commentary that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. Although Title II, the, the issue of public accommodations, was, the, was probably the most talked about section of the Civil Rights Act, the section about which emotions ran highest, the section over which the most blood had been spilled, it quickly faded in significance. It became, to paraphrase Hugh Davis Graham, a welcome casualty of success. I would be willing to bet some good money that m the great mass of students graduate from this law school without ever reading a case involving the actual enforcement of Title II, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That, by the way, is not an indictment of this great law school. It's because nobody's thinking about Title II, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. One of you could master the case law of, the 19, of Title II, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, in a weekend without breaking a sweat. You could do it, because there's not much to it. Compliance with the law was relatively prompt and extensive. There had been, you know, people had sort of, there had been, warning, been warnings about uh, massive resistance to Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Didn't happen. There was some, there was some resistance. There was some resistance. Um, Lester Maddox became governor of uh, Georgia because of his resistance. But that was an outlier. The fact of the matter is, when Title II came into operation, it went in, it was, it, it was carried out without a whole lot of uh, huffing uh, and puffing. The relative success of Title II was reflected to a large extent in the comparative simplicity, uniformity, and continuity of the case law built upon it. There arose no effective concerted campaign of resistance. Title II has never been amended. Compare that to Title VII. Title VII's been amended a bunch of times. 
Title VII has given rise to lots of controversy. Title VII has given rise to a tremendous case law. People fight and squabble today over Title VII, not over Title II. Now, you might ask, well, you know, why is that so? What does that suggest? One thing it suggests is, well, you know, Title II wasn't all that big a deal. And you, 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 might, you, you might take that position. Let me read you a statement by Bayard Rustin in a wonderful piece that Bayard Rustin wrote in 1965 called From uh, Protest to Politics. This is what Bayard Rustin wrote. And this should mean something. I mean, Bayard Rustin was one of the greats of the Civil Rights Revolution. His name is not mentioned a whole lot now, but he was, well, he was the organizer of the Great March on Washington. Very important figure. This is what he wrote. In desegregating public accommodations, we affected institutions which are relatively peripheral to the American socioeconomic socio order and to the fundamental conditions of life of the Negro people. In a highly industrialized 20th century civilization, we hit Jim Crow precisely where it was most anachronistic, dispensable, and vulnerable, in hotels, lunch counters, terminals, swimming pools, and the like. For in these forms, Jim Crow does impede the flow of commerce in the broadest sense. It is a nuisance in a society on the move and on the make. And I mean, Baird Rustin was saying, you know, listen, and I was there, I saw people fighting and dying, and so I don't want to make light of that. But in passing Title II, in getting rid of Jim Crow at the lunch counter, we got to rid of something that was really quite vulnerable. And while it was progress, it was very limited. Now, you could take that position. In fact, nowadays, I hear people take that position all the time. So for instance, in discussions about Title II and discussions about the sit-ins, one often hears the following sentence. What does it matter if you have a right to get a hamburger at the lunch counter, but you don't have the money to pay for the hamburger? People say that. I don't think that's right. I, I challenge that. In a few hours, I'm going to get on an airplane and head back home. I am going to go into coach class. Now, there is nothing preventing me from getting a first class ticket other than my bank account cannot handle it. Does it mean something to me that even though I'm not going to be traveling in first class, I have a right to travel in first class if I want to pay the money to do it? Yes, it does mean something to me. Yes, it does mean something to me. And here I will repeat a statement that I made in my very first lecture, which is that in symbolism, there is substance. The four students who sat in, in this state, did something great and important when they did, when they demanded service at the lunch counter and all that that entailed. And it's for that reason that it seems to me that Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which we take for granted, it's a wonderful thing that we're able to take it for granted. We take it for granted, it's a wonderful thing that we can. But in looking back at Title II, it seems to me that we should be grateful and we should recognize that it is an important and substantive landmark in our democracy. Thank you very much. Do I have time?
I'm getting the hook, but um, rkennedy at law.harvard.edu is the email address. And I'd love to hear from people who have questions, comments, or by all means, objections. See you next month. Thank you very much.